Thank you very much. Um, the title of this talk is Does Global Financial Transparency Improve Tax Compliance Among the Rich in Developing Countries? It is a joint work with Lauke Larsen, who is in Copenhagen, and Nadine Riedel from Münster. Uh, what you see in these slides uh, is our views, like not necessarily those of uh, South African institutions and authorities. Um, you know, so this is really a work in progress, so I'm very happy to, to take comments and uh, suggestions from you, like either now or uh, after the talk. Uh, and let me say that I'm also a little bit worried about presenting it here because we have people who are much more knowledgeable about South Africa than myself in the room. Uh, so again, that's, I mean, I hope to get, uh, to get good and candid uh, feedback from, from you guys. All right. Uh, and so this talk really uh, ties like very directly to what Angelo is just talking about because what we mean by global financial transparency here uh, is really like this kind of automatic information exchange that we just had introduced. All right, so we know that there is a lot of wealth, a lot of assets that are invested through uh, offshore financial centers. So there's one estimate up here of uh, $6 trillion that corresponds to around 10% of household wealth uh, globally. And there are other estimates out there um, in a similar magnitude. So uh, there's also evidence that, you know, that uh, a lot of this wealth, at least historically, has not been tax compliant. So people would use these offshore accounts to, you know, hide money from tax authorities. Uh, and there's also now evidence from many countries that this is really, like these assets are really concentrated at the very top of the wealth distribution. This is money like belonging to the very wealthiest people in our societies. So, so this like makes you worried that this, like these offshore financial centers, they really facil facilitate uh, offshore tax evasion among the very wealthiest on a, on a big scale. So uh, the global policy community has taken this quite seriously in the sense that they have actually uh, like implemented a policy that Angel just, Angel just uh, talked about um, at a global level that is a very ambitious attempt to, to tackle this, this issue. So automatic information exchange means concretely that if I tomorrow travel to Zurich and open a Swiss bank account, well then the home, like my home tax authorities will like be informed about kind of the account balance and the income accruing to that account next year. So makes, making it very hard for me to now kind of uh, in principle to evade taxes on that income. Um, so this is hugely ambitious. Uh, why? Well, because right, this is in a way is the first serious attempt to roll out like automatic third party information uh, on a global level, and we know that third-party report information is kind of maybe may, may the most powerful tool to really uh, counter uh, tax non-compliance. That said, it's also true that this kind of cooperation comes with many, many practical challenges and obstacles. I've been working now like in three countries with tax authorities, and it, 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 it's just it's very difficult to, to really use this information in the same way as, you know, third-party report information from, from domestic sources still. Like, there's still a lot of scope for improvement. But anyway, but so what we are what we are after in this pro pro uh, project that uh, is implemented in South Africa is really to understand like how this like very ambitious policy, how and how much it contributes to tax compliance in, in developing countries, uh, allowing ourselves to generalize a little bit from the South African case. And so this is the paper in a nutshell. So we use administrative microdata from South Africa to assess the policy, and we are basically after uh, three questions. So one is the scope of the policy, like so basically how much. South African-owned wealth does, uh, is, is covered by this new uh, third-party reporting, and also how is this wealth distributed uh, within South Africa. We will also try to say something about what we call exposed non-compliance, so basically after this policy has been implemented, so how large is then the gap between the income that we think people that we think people really have abroad, which you can say this is the, the income reported by, by foreign banks, and then uh, the, the income that people themselves report on their tax return, like the self-reported foreign income. So that would be like a measure of, uh, of the compliance gap that still exists after the policy has been put in place. And then finally, we'll, we'll try to uh, say something about like compliance responses. So basically, can we, can we, can we see that, I mean, that the policy uh, has had an effect in itself by kind of pushing people to, to, uh, to self-report uh, more foreign income? 
So that's a little bit, a bit the story about like how did we how did we get to the exposed compliance non-compliance that we that we see in the data. And time is short, so let me just uh, give you a preview of the a preview of the findings here, like before I go into the to the details. Uh, so at least you you get this uh, takeaway with you. So uh, the scope of the policy, we find that the South African taxpayers, so personal taxpayers, have assets around 500 uh, billion South African rand on offshore uh, accounts, and like it's heavily concentrated in the highest income groups, and most of it is located in what we used to call uh, tax havens. This corresponds roughly to 5% of, of household wealth in South Africa that is on these, uh, these foreign accounts. In terms of ex post compliance, so basically just really comparing kind of the, the offshore income that the foreign banks report that South Africans have to what they themselves report on their tax return, suggests that there's still like a pretty significant gap that basically what the banks report is like three times larger than what people themselves uh, report on their tax return. Suggesting that there's, I mean, and this is there are a number of caveats here, um, so, and and one is really that I mean our data set for now only runs until 2017, like the tax data set. So this is really kind of like really the first year where this information uh, was available, meaning that you know that it, it might have improved a lot over time. This is something that we are we are keenly interested in in, uh, in finding out. And then when we study compliance responses, so really kind of basically what we're doing we're comparing people who. Who, uh, who like received or like where reports on their foreign accounts are uh, filed at different points in time and see can we see like some systematic patterns in when they start to self-report more and we find very little of that like basically uh, like very small kind of self-reporting responses to this uh, like onset of bank reporting and again this could be like something that reflects just that we are looking at the very early uh, time period and they might have improved over time hopefully all right, so let me uh, dig into it. So just very briefly on the data. So we, we, we use two data sources. So first we have people's personal income tax returns. And what is interesting here is of course, like both like their total income, we can say something about where people are in the income distribution, but also we can see like very uh, specific, specific information on different uh, income components, uh, for example, foreign interest income, foreign dividend income, and so on. And we can match that with these uh, CRS forms that are submitted by foreign banks um, at the individual level. Uh, so that requires, however, that, the, that there is like a tax ID number on the CRS form. That's not always the case. And also that it actually does match to something uh, in this universe of, uh, of personal income tax returns. That's also not the case, always. I'll come back to that in a second. So uh, here's a picture that illustrates kind of the the aggregate account or, or aggregate uh, account balances of South Africans in foreign banks and how it has evolved over time. So this is what I call offshore wealth here, and you can see that it kind of it climbs over time as the black line up to around uh, 500 billion rand in uh, 2020. There's also like a split on what we call tax havens and non-havens, uh, and you can see that, that like, like around two thirds of this South African wealth abroad is placed in, in tax havens like Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore, Cayman Islands, and so on. Um, so this, you could get the impression here that this is something that is increasing a lot over time. In fact, this mostly reflects, you know, this, that, that uh, more and more jurisdictions are reporting to South Africa. So if you look at kind of different reporting waves one at a time, you can see this, this is roughly constant. Most of the, the increase is just because the CRS is kind of being based in. So, um, so like aggregate offshore wealth around 500 billion rands, again, this kind of roughly in line with previous estimates and also what people uh, doing wealth accounting have, have uh, used. Um, and, and, you know, like so the number of reasons why this actually might understate uh, true offshore wealth. For example, there are some asset classes not covered here. There might be imperfect reporting by banks. There might be more accounts that are held kind of through personal holding companies that are really household wealth too, and so on and so on. All right, so how, how am I doing on time? I forgot to start the timer. Okay, I'm doing fine, good. <laughs> so um, so now let me come back to, the, if we want to kind of to say something about who are the owners of, of this uh, offshore wealth, we need to kind of to, do, to, to use this match to uh, personal income tax returns. And uh, so this turns out to be a little bit tricky. So in fact, we can only match something like 40% of, uh, of these CRS returns to, uh, to income tax returns. 
And that reflects two things. So first, like oftentimes there's just no uh, tax ID number. So that, uh, that's, that's one thing. And then there are other cases where these TIN numbers just don't match to any uh, tax paper. And I think like, so this can probably be improved, at least the, the last uh, part of it. But I think this also kind of speaks to, to a real challenge, you know, that, uh, that also Angela mentioned and has probably become smaller over time, but just that it's not super easy to get like a package of data from foreign tax authorities and then just match it on your own tax return. So something that really requires some work uh, before you can, you can actually use this for something useful. What is a little bit reassuring is that now we can kind of take the universe of these CRS reports and then we can compare kind of the characteristics of those accounts across those that are matched those that, and those that just, I mean, within those that cannot be matched, those that have and do not have a, a tax ID number. And it turns out that, you know, that, that, the, uh, that accounts that are high balance, that are kind of large accounts that belong to, that are high income, uh, that are active and that are in havens, actually are more likely to have a TIN number and also uh, if they have a TIN number to match to a tax return. So this kind of goes against the idea that kind of really sophisticated and smart tax evaders can somehow avoid that their, uh, that their account is reported. It, it seems to be the opposite, actually. So there seems to be little kind of, uh, yeah, that can be actively done here to, to escape uh, matching. Five minutes, all right. So let me just say something uh, about kind of the, the income gradient in this offshore account ownership, just to, to make the case that also in South Africa, it's the case that, you know, that these accounts mostly belong to very uh, high income people. So this uh, on the X axis here are broken down, like uh, I've created these income groups. So by the, so the first uh, group is the bottom decile, then the next decile, this and so on. And at the very top, you have the further to the right, you have the, the 0 0.01% uh, of uh, income tax earners. And here I'm just showing you kind of the, the, the share of people who have an account in the CRS. And you can see that this is around 30% of the very top income earners who have like a, a foreign account in the CRS, even despite kind of the, the imperfect matching, right? So that makes it even more impressive. And really below the top 5%, there's almost no one who has uh, a foreign account. If you take the total kind of uh, universe of assets and just say what, what share belongs to different positions of the income distribution, you get this picture where you can see that like around 30%, so one third of the total assets belong to the, to the top 0.01%, so like a very tiny group that really owns like a, a big uh, fraction of these, uh, of these foreign assets. So, so like in other countries, like this, this issue here is really about like, uh, like wealthy people, high income people who have these foreign accounts. How much uh, non-compliance is there? So again, um, so, so um, let me just show you, go right to the picture. So this is what I, what I alluded to earlier, where we basically, we, has, we make, we just compare two time series here. So the gray uh, time series is basically like the foreign financial income that South Africans report on their personal tax return. And the black line is uh, the foreign financial incomes that foreign banks say that South Africans have in those banks. And you can see that there's a gap here, right? That there's uh, something like uh, 4 billion uh, SAR on, uh, on people's tax returns, which compares to around 14 billion uh, SAR, uh, rand, sorry, on, on, uh, on these uh, foreign reports, suggesting a gap of around uh, 10, uh, 10 billion rands here that would then be uh, kind of underestimated, under reporting of offshore financial income. So that is in 2007 and we would love to, and we are working on kind of extending this gray line to see like how this develops over time. It could be that, you know, this non-compliance gap, it, it shrinks as tax authorities are doing their work. You know, they are kind of uh, cracking down on people who have a gap on their tax return and so on. Uh, and this is something we would really like to, to look into. Um, Finally, this question, so how did we get there? So like, can we, can we see evidence of any um, like, so compliance responses to information exchange? Again, what we're doing, I won't go into the details here, but we're basically con comparing people who, because they had assets in different countries, they get reported on uh, at different points in time. So there is like a first CRS wave here who, where the, report, the first report uh, arrives in 2016. And then there are like a later wave where the, the first report uh, arrives later on. So we can kind of use that to identify a, a compliance response. So if you just look at um, 
at the extensive margin, so just basically an indicator of whether you have any foreign income on uh, your account, so on your tax return, you can see that you know something that, that looks like a response, so kind of that the, this is like the differential probability of so reporting foreign income of those who get it the first report in 2016 versus those who get it in 2018 or 19. You can see like it's not that they are like on perfectly parallel trajectories uh, before kind of these reports start uh, hitting the ground, but uh, but there is something like a differential increase in 2016 when these first reports arrive. But it's relatively small. You can see it's only like something like three percent, so like three percentage points uh, of a response. If you look at the intensive margins, so basically among those who who have foreign income, is does is there like an an percentage increase that is larger, like for those who get a, re a report uh, versus those who don't, it, it doesn't really look like there is anything at this point. So let me conclude. I think I'm, uh, my time is, is up. So just like if you look at the aggregate offshore wealth of South Africans, it amounts to around 500 billion rand, which is like roughly 5% of, of national wealth, and it's highly concentrated in the highest income groups. It looks like just comparing kind of time series for people's own self-reported foreign income and uh, the bank reported foreign income, that there is like a still a significant uh, compliance gap of around uh, 10 billion rand in, of income. Uh, and this is as of 2017, it would be nice to have that updated. And, uh, and finally, like we, we don't see a lot of uh, evidence of kind of behavioral responses that people, you know, start reporting more foreign income at the point when these uh, foreign information reports start arriving. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.